Let us hear then the written word of the Lord from the Old Testament selection starting from Exodus 13, 14, and 15. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent you to me. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. Yahweh passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love to thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Numbers twenty three nineteen. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it, or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? Deuteronomy 4.35 To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord is God. There is no other besides him. 6.4 Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, the Lord, is one. Job 11, 7. Can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? Jeremiah 10, 1 through 11. Hear the word that the Lord speaks to you, the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, Learn not the way of the nations, nor be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, because the nations are dismayed at them, for the customs of the people are vanity. A tree from the forest is cut down and worked with an axe by the hands of a craftsman. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails so that it cannot move. Their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field, and they cannot speak. They have to be carried, for they cannot walk. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither is it in them to do good. There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? For this is your due, for among all the wise ones of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. They are both stupid and foolish. The instruction of idols is but wood. Beaten silver is brought from Tarshish and gold from Uphaz. They are the work of the craftsmen in the hands of the goldsmith. Their clothing is violet and purple. They are all the work of skilled men. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. And at his wrath, the earth quakes and the nations cannot endure his indignation. Thus shall you say to them, the gods who did not make the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens. Turn to the New Testament, John 4, 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. John 8, 57 and 58. So the Jews said to Jesus, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Romans 1, 20. His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they, the people of the world, are without excuse. Romans eleven thirty three through 36 Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. 1 Corinthians 8, 4. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. 1 Timothy 1, 17. To the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And James 1, 17. For every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So far the written word. Our God and Father, we ask, O Lord, for you to show us mercy by revealing yourself to us, especially 
through Christ the Son, that we would both see your glory and not be destroyed by it, and instead would also know your mercy through the mediation of Christ's ministry. So now we ask that we would know you, the one true God, as the only God, and we would have confidence in our hearts to reject our own foolishness and the idols of this age and have confidence in you alone. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Everybody in the world has a basis for how they function. They have a worldview, a principle by which they live. For most people, however, this is unexamined. They never thought about it. They're born, they live in a family, the family has certain principles, they're in a country, there's certain rules. They just go along with it. And they assume that they understand and recognize what is right and true. But when they're actually exposed to philosophy and theology, they begin to realize they really haven't considered or thought through these things. And for many of them, they would rather not, and they will stop. Others will say, yeah, I know there's all these big questions, but it's not important enough to me, or I don't have the time. I'll just trust others that they figured it out, and I'll just go along with it. But we are thinking beings, because we're made in the image of God. And every one of us is called to think and consider what is the real, what is the true, and to act in accordance with that. And God has revealed himself. He's not left us to fumble about and have to discover using our own minds what is all truth. Rather, he reveals it to us in his word. And the church's job is to proclaim this so that people would know what is real and what is the truth. God is, and God is the creator, and we are living in his world. Now, this Confession, of course, begins our theology. And as you see there on the bottom of page 15, we are looking at Article 1 of the Belgic Confession of Faith. Now, some people will say, you know what, I'm, you know, I'm a good person. Whatever else is out there, I'm going to be fine. Terrible decision. Because the moment in which you become angry at someone about any action, you are saying something is wrong. And when you do the very same thing, and we all do, then you've now condemned yourself, and there is no hope for you. So you need to know, is there a way of redemption? And of course there is. Jesus has revealed that to us. What we have in the confession of faith, then, is an explanation and understanding. We are laying out for people the revelation of God, but summarizing it and systematizing it so that it is teachable and understandable. So the Belgic confession of faith is written in a particular context, but it has a universal truth in it. And last week we began by looking at we all believe with our hearts and confess with our mouths. We were saying that as Christians, we know what God has said, and it is our profession to the world that this is our hope and our comfort, both in this life and in the age to come. Well, today we start looking at the particulars. The first thing is we live in a world of one God. Why is this important? Well, keep in mind that throughout most public education and um, among many in the uh, influential offices, they believe in a materialistic world, a world simply of matter and energy, which by chance has developed into what we are. There is no morality. There is no ultimate consequence to anything. Just do what feels right. Of course, after saying this, they still give you a list of rules to obey because they recognize that such a nihilistic way of thinking, this idea of no God, no morality, leads to complete chaos and utter destruction. And of course, they are saying, well, we are going to become gods. Yes, the world is just this world of material and energy. By chance has developed this. But since there's no guiding principle, we will be it. And so we will be the gods who will give you law, and we will govern you. We will bless you or punish you. And of course, in all these things, what are they doing? They are trying to replace God. They, they are idols, and they are trying to be gods themselves. And of course, they are terrible at it. They give you bad commands, and of course, they destroy the righteous. There are many other religions. Some will say, well, there is kind of a karmic principle in the universe and things will work out. Well, that's not really a helpful thing because if I've done something bad, that means it's only going to work out if something bad happens to me. There is no hope in that. And if all it's going to balance out, then in the end, it amounts to nothingness. That's also pointless. 
Then, of course, there is polytheism, the idea that there are many different gods. Well, if you have many different gods, then you have competitors, and you know maybe you choose the right side, maybe you don't. There is no hope in all these things. But the fact is, we understand that we live in a world that is ordered. It's a world that is beautiful. It is a world that has incredible potential for blessing others. Well, this is by design, because a loving God, who is perfect in every way, created the world. Well, what about the bad things we see? Well, that's a consequence of our rebellion. And that's revealed in the scriptures as well. Man was not content with God being God and rebelled against him and brought destruction. And yet God is merciful, as we already saw. Be merciful for your father is merciful. And in mercy, he made provision to pay off our debt, to cancel out the guilt of our sins, and to give us life everlasting. And this can only be found through the mediation of Jesus, through the remedy that God has provided. And so if we are going to rest in Christ alone, then we are affirming that there is only one access to God, and that is Jesus, and that's because there's only one God to get back to. So by beginning the Belgic Confession with the doctrine, the article of God, we are saying that this defines reality for us. We live in a world made by God that there is only one God and he is the God of the scriptures. And this is what we believe in our hearts, what we confess with our mouths. Now let's look at the scriptures to back up this claim. You see there in Exodus chapter 3, remember the story. God had called Abraham and told Abraham, your children will be enslaved and then I will free them and I will give them the land of promise. And now after 400 years in Egypt, the, the, the Israelites have become slaves and now God is ready to redeem them. And he calls Moses to be his minister to the people. But Moses says, I don't, I'm not really up for this job. And who am I even supposed to tell them is God that is sending me? And this is where God gives his name. We think it's probably pronounced Yahweh. We're not 100% sure. But that is the Hebrew for I am who I am or I will be who I will be. So what is God's name? God's name is I am existence itself. I am all things. So God said to Moses, go back to the people of Israel and tell them, it is I am, Yahweh, who has sent me, who has sent you. Say to the people, I am has sent me to you because I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And my name forever will be, my name will be remembered forever throughout all generations. Why is this important for us? Because we discovered that God is a God who speaks. You think, well, what's the big deal? Well, here's the big deal. Many people think that God is hidden and that God will be discovered by our meditating, by our spending time, by our considering the evidence. No, God has not hidden himself. God shows himself in many different ways in creation. But especially he speaks to his people. And he has spoken through the prophets and the apostles. That's what's recorded in the Bible. That's what we preach to you. That is what gives you knowledge of God and therefore brings you the spirit of Christ. And God says, I am. And I am the one who will rescue you. Why is God a rescuer? Look at Exodus 34. Moses has been given this great task to do he feels overwhelmed but he says well since i am in this difficult position can you at least show yourself to me and god says actually you're not ready to see me you will be destroyed by my glory but he does allow moses to see his glory as he's passing away so he covers up moses he goes up before him and then as he's receding as he's going away he sees something but this is what moses hears yahweh passed before moses and proclaimed Yahweh, Yahweh, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding, overflowing in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love or covenantal love for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, but who's also just. He will by no means clear the guilty, and he will visit iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So when God reveals himself, notice how he reveals himself. In contrast to what I said earlier, when man tries to take the place of God and just simply give rules, God reveals himself as a God 
of mercy, a God who is gracious, a God who has been sinned against and yet is slow to anger and is quick to forgive iniquity, transgression, and sin. This is an incredible thing to discover because that means when we become aware that God is and we realize our sinfulness, we don't need to flee from him. But knowing that he is a God who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, we can run to him to obtain these blessings. But he is a God who will not forgive everyone. The guilty will be punished. We'll see more of what that means as time goes on. Numbers 23. He also reveals that if he said it, it remains true forever. Because God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he would change his mind. If God has said it, he will do it. End of story. That's great news for us. Deuteronomy 4 and Deuteronomy 6, these are things that Israelites were to teach their children. So instead of children seeing the example of their mothers and fathers and following bad examples, because then they will be cursed, their children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, Instead, the mothers and the fathers have said, teach your children that I am God and I am the only God, that the God of Israel is the one God and this one God is the only God and this God is the God revealed to Moses as slow to anger, abounding in covenantal love, quick to forgive sin, transgression, and iniquity. Job, before even the time of Israel, was told by his friends, you cannot know the limits of God. And this is important. We are saying things God has told us. We're not saying we know everything about him. So God is much greater than our mere creaturely minds can comprehend. The prophet Jeremiah. This is one who is called at a time in which Israel is about to be judged and destroyed. Remember, God had blessed Israel. He had revealed himself to Israel. He had given to them the temple and the priesthood so that they would be reminded of sin, but of where forgiveness could also be found. And they had had contempt for this. And instead of worshiping the one God alone in his temple, they had brought idols into the temples. And so finally the day of judgment had come upon Israel. And Jeremiah is the last prophet speaking to Jews in Jerusalem before the destruction. And here is the message that Jeremiah is giving to them. Hear the word that the Lord speaks, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, Do not learn the way of the nations that are around you, or be dismayed when you see in creation or in the heavens signs, just like the nations are overwhelmed, dismayed, panicked because of them. The customs of the peoples are vanity, empty, vapor. The people of the world cut down trees, form it by craftsmen, and they worship their handiwork as gods. Or in our case, we have philosophers who sit around, sit around, contemplate a system of thought, and then they sell it to us as reality. This is Eastern meditation. It's modern Western philosophy. But in all these things, It's vapor. It's vanity. It means nothing. And yet we panic because of what they teach us. No, the reality is verse 6. There is no one like you, O Lord. You are great. Your name is great in might. And it's foolish, but many people do not fear him. We should. The rest of the world, verse 8, stupid and foolish. And the instruction of their idols and philosophical systems is wooden and worthless. We instead, verse 10, we have the true, the Lord, the living God, the living God, an everlasting king. And when he comes in judgment, the nations will not be able to endure. And finally, all these foolish idols and philosophies of the world will perish from the earth when he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Turning to the New Testament, the same thought continues. Jesus tells the woman at the well that God is spirit. He is not material. He's not an idol, nor is he bound up to our limits. He is spirit. And when we worship God, we worship him in spirit and truth. But another remarkable thing is Jesus makes a declaration that he is the I am. The Jews are questioning Jesus about why he speaks with authority. Why does he think he knows better than the Jewish teachers? And Jesus says, well, because I am. So Jesus is making a declaration that he is God. And that will be part of, of course, what we have in the confessions later explaining this further. Romans 1. 
When we look at creation, we see the invisible attributes of God, his eternal power and his divine nature, meaning that everybody in all the world, even if they don't have Bibles, have an awareness that there is someone greater than them out there. That's why they are without excuse. And in Romans 11, after Paul has spoken of Jesus and the redemption of sinners through the cross, he is speaking of this wonder of God. And that's why now he feels overwhelmed. Just like we were told that we cannot, uh, in Job, that you cannot know the limits of God. So here is Paul in the New Testament bringing the same idea. The depth of the riches and wisdom of knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. Inscrutable his ways. Who has known the mind of God? Indeed, who has been a counselor to God? Or who has given a gift to God that he should expect God to repay him? No, rather from God, through God and to God are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. In the letter to the Corinthians, Paul affirms that yes, indeed, all around you, the Roman people are worshiping idols. But those idols have no real existence because there's only one God. So it doesn't matter how many others do things, how, many, how much they say, in the end, their word has no value. Rather, as you see there in First Timothy and in James, there is one God, immortal, invisible, the only God who deserves all glory, and we expect every good from him. And because he's made a promise and there's no variation or shadow due to change, he's not a man that he can lie. We can rely on his promises. So clearly what we see, when God spoke through the prophets and the apostles, he wanted the hearers to know he is really God. He really exists and he really does good for us and he alone should be our hope. Over and against this, of course, is every other religion and philosophy of this world. And we need to be aware then of what is true. Now you need to weigh these things. We don't simply say, well, we have the truth because we're better than others. That would be a very arrogant statement. We do believe we have the truth, but we are very humbled with this because God has revealed it to us. We were not better or smarter. We were shown mercy. And what is it that God wants people to know about him? Well, obviously he wants us to know that he is the all-powerful God, the king of glory. He is to be worshipped. But since no one has done that naturally... What is it that God wants people to hear about this? He wants us to hear that he is also merciful and gracious. And so when God reveals himself to man, he doesn't come in the power of lightning, volcanoes, earthquakes only. He does that to show his power. But what does he do primarily? In fact, when the Israelites wanted to build idols and other things, God said, don't. Why? Because when I revealed myself, you heard my voice. What is he doing with his voice? Speaking the words of mercy. Saying, I will be your deliverer. I am God the Redeemer. I am the God who is gracious and merciful to thousands of generations. And expect good from me when you come to me as God. When you come to me as the giver of life. I will most certainly do these things. So as Christians then, we begin our profession of faith declaring there is a single and simple spiritual being whom we call God. Now the word simple does not mean he's not complicated, but this is philosophical as in he is not multiple things. Like you are complex. You are spirit and you are body. But God as eternal God is simple. He is just spirit. So that's what it means here. He is a single, simple, spiritual being whom we call God. He is eternal. He is incomprehensible. We cannot know him fully. He is invisible. We will not see him with our natural eyes. He is unchangeable. He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He is infinite. He is beyond all space and time. He is almighty, powerful, able to do whatever he wants. And this is good because he is completely wise, just, and good. And he has the power to execute this goodness. And lastly, what we will look at next week, the overflowing fountain of all good. Now let's go back and remember the context in which the Belgian Confession is written. This is the writing of one man, but then it was received by the church modified before we made it our official confession. This is Pastor Guido Debray. 
And this, he was living at a time in which the Holy Roman Emperor was refusing to allow the Reformation to take place in his lands. And he was actually finding Reformed ministers and putting them to death so that, as he thought, they were stop corrupting his people. And Guido de Bray writes this to give to the governor who was there to say, please know, we are not here to rebel against the king. We are not here bringing to you a new God, but rather the God of the scriptures that you claim to obey. So let me put into words what I am preaching. I want you to know where my hope and confidence lies. And he begins by declaring this. I come before you with the saints of God in the city, believing in our hearts and confessing with our mouths one true God. This God is a great God, but not a God we can comprehend and limit as he is infinite, but a God who does reveal himself mercifully to us. And the great thing he reveals is that he is the overflowing fountain of all good. And that's where we begin our confession as well. Now, I remember the Belgic Confession has 37 articles, beginning with the doctrine of God, then going to the doctrine of creation, the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, the Spirit, the mediation of Jesus Christ, the formation of the church, the use of preaching and sacraments, how we live in the state, and of course, what is the end, and that is when we shall come to glory. So the Belgic Confession is a wonderful summary of the Christian faith, and over the next few months, that is what we will be looking at and showing you scripturally why we have this confession in the way we do, and I pray also that the Spirit of God will give you a firm confidence in this revelation as not only being good, but all sufficient and your only hope and comfort in life and in death. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, may it be that we would, like the saints who have gone before, believe with our hearts and profess with our mouths this wonderful truth. You are a merciful and gracious God to sinners. And because you have made a promise of redemption and you do not lie, and by an oath you have testified, we can be certain that you will never change your mind to as many as are found in Christ Jesus, that our sins are forgiven and we have everlasting life. And with this confidence, therefore, let us never fall for the lies of this age through idolaters and philosophers who would lead us away from you. May we remember always that you were merciful and you spoke, and because of you, we have the hope of life and resurrection. So we pray, O God, for your name to be glorified in the church and for the church to be a light to the nations. Amen. And so, beloved, we will continue then by affirming that it is indeed to the one true God and not to idols we give our devotion. And so we will stand and sing Psalm 115, not to us, Lord. Please stand. <laughs> 